John and I have been working on this case in my office. It was weird not having Anna around. I was, I was so desperately hoping that my suspicions were wrong, that she, that she wasn't dead. It's just hiding until the case was over. I was taking a break. The office was cold. So cold we could see our breath. And neither of us really knew what to do about the whole stitch thing. We looked through the pictures, read the journals, and watched the tapes. God knows how many times. I mean, we would watch the tapes in slow motion, looking for any little clues that might tell us where to find him, but we, but we couldn't find anything. First we were thinking that he may have been hiding somewhere outdoors. He always seemed sort of dirty and di- disheveled, like he didn't have access to a shower or and was always running around barefoot. Then we wondered, if he was an outdoorsman, why was he naked? Doesn't he get cold? Then we played around with the idea that he lived in an, a cave somewhere, which, which would make sense. He'd have some warmth so that he could wander around naked all he wanted to, but it, it still didn't quite work in our heads. Since when do supernatural creatures and serial killers not have homes and established lives outside of their murder sprees? Vampires, you think, live in castles, mansions, and whatnot. Werewolves are like... Werewolves are only like that once a month. So they obviously have stuff to do the rest of the time, and have a house. Even zombies sort of have a home. They're they're coffins until they rise from the dead. What would make Stitch want to be the outcast and not have a house and an established life? Nothing was making sense to us. Our heads hurt, our coffee was running out, the sun was going down. The work week was coming to an end. Our options were running out. Thankfully, no one else had been killed. But surely, it, it would happen again. Stitch wasn't one to sit and do nothing for extended periods of time. What do you want to do? I asked John, as I stretched out my back. Before he could answer, the door to my office slammed open and an FBI team walked in. We need you two to come in for questioning, the only one in a suit said. The rest of them were wearing the typical FBI uniforms with their guns and everything. John and I were confused. What could we have, what could we have done to catch the FBI's attention? We complied and went with the team willingly. We all walked out of the office quietly. My co-workers watched, just as confused as we were. Their eyes were all wide. Some of them mouthed words at me, asking me what was going on. I just shrugged. I really had no idea. They shoved us into the back of a car and drove us to where they wanted to question us. We arrived at the jail in downtown Seattle. It was a tan building with small windows with bars over them so the prisoners couldn't escape. I was scared. I looked over at John. He was squeezing his hands together. I could see they were sweaty. He had wide eyes like he was a child caught stealing candy. Huh. My palms were sweaty too. I'm sure my eyes were just as wide. We were let out of the car. Two men grabbed both my arms and pulled me into the building. I don't know what we'd done to deserve such harsh treatment. They didn't give us time to look around the building, but I didn't really mind. I'd been there countless times. I was just confused by why we were being brought in there for questioning. John and I were put into separate rooms. Each room had white walls, a white tile floor, a white ceiling, and a white light. There was a metal table in the middle of the room with chairs all around it. I was told to sit down and wait. So I did as I was told in an attempt to stop the brutal treatment. The walls were entirely bare of everything. Even texture. As I waited, I tried to find something to fix my eyes on. But I was so nervous, I could hardly sit still. I tapped my feet and drummed my fingers and chewed my nails. What could I have possibly done? I'm just a detective! I'm the one who's supposed to be solving the cases. Not be a suspect or anything. And interrupting my thought, a man in a gray suit walks in with a file. He sits down across the table from me and just looks at me for what I felt like an eternity. You're probably wondering why we brought you and your intern in here, he said. 
His voice was deep and scratchy. Yeah, you're probably wondering why we brought you and your intern in here, he said. His voice was deep and scratchy. He had a bird's nest type of hair, mostly white with shades of gray. His eyes were tired and old, like they'd seen everything to be seen. I nodded at him, unsure if I was allowed to speak. And what do you know about... He looks at his papers. Repetitive routine. What do you know about his death? I know what happened on the tapes, I said. What do you know? Is there anything we should know that can't be learned through the tapes? What do you mean? I asked. The bright light was making my headache worse. What did you have to do with it? Nothing! I said, shocked. I didn't kill him, if that's what you're asking me. He offered to help us find Stitch, and that's what ended up happening. Stitch came and killed him. We didn't think that that would happen, but it did. And from that side of the webcam, you can't really do anything. My speech got faster and faster as I kept talking. Was I really a suspect in his death? My own investigation? Okay, the man said. Calm down. We're just investigating his death. That made me fume. That was my case. I didn't work so hard to become the best detective in Seattle PD just to have my case taken from me. Even if it was impossible to solve. You're free to go, the man said. We'll be in touch with any further information on his death. I nodded at him and walked into the hall. As I waited in the hallway for John to come out of his interrogation, an idea crossed my mind. An illegal one, mind you, but an idea nonetheless. And despite its illegality, I decided to pursue it. I jogged down the hall to the man who'd questioned me and asked him where the nearest bathroom is. He pointed and said down the hall, around the corner. So I walked down the plain hallway and stood just around the corner near the restroom. I peeked around to see the man go into a room with a folder and come out without it. When the coast was clear, I snuck into the room quietly so no one could hear. The room was dark and dank, with file folders covering all the walls. The files were organized in alphabetical order, so I found the J folder and searched for my file. At last I found it. Johnson Ryan. I opened it and found a small notebook. Flipping through it, the pages were covered in notes. I smiled to myself. And suddenly, I heard the door open, so I stuffed the notebook into my pocket and closed the drawer quickly and silently. A woman with sharp features and a stern expression walked in. What are you doing in here? She asked. I was looking for the bathroom, I said. Wrong room. It's down the hall and around the corner, she said. Okay, thank you, I said. I walked out of the room and found John waiting at the end of the hall by the rooms we'd been questioned in. I swiftly walked to him and gestured for him to follow. We stepped out of the building into the crisp Seattle air. I kept walking until we were a good distance away from the building. Then I pulled the journal out of my pocket and showed it to him. He looked at me with concern. Did you steal that? He asked. I nodded, but didn't care that he was worried. We were already in trouble. I flipped to the first page. It talked about how we were suspects in repetitive routines murder. John Freeman and Ryan Johnson. Present at time of crime, could have been orchestrated in the ploy to solve serial killer case. Follow after questioning. That made both of us nervous. We looked around as soon as we read that, looking for suspicious cars, cars of different colors and models whizzed around us, but nothing was standing still watching us. We felt small raindrops start to hit our heads and necks. So we started walking, and fast, as fast as we could to the office. The rain started to really pour and get us soaking wet before we reached our cars. I was thinking, we should go up to Anne's parents' house. She might be staying with them, I told John. Let's go now, he said. Why not? The sooner we find her... The sooner we let our minds ease, I agreed with him. 
and we both piled into my car. It was getting dark as I pulled out into traffic and eventually onto the freeway. The clouds were ominous. They were dark gray. The rain was pouring on my car. John and I were silent the whole time. Neither of us knew what to say. We didn't know what we were going to find, but both of us were praying to whatever God was out there that we'd find Anna alive. A couple hours went by. The weather kept getting worse, and the sun kept going further down until it was pitch black outside. That's when I felt a bump. And then it got really hard to drive all of a sudden. I pulled over to the side of the road and jumped out of my car. The front left tire was completely flat. Great! I nearly screamed. Just awesome! John got out of the car and looked at the wheel. I ran my hand through my messy hair and sighed. It's already getting late. I didn't want to deal with this. Especially given the situation. What if Stitch found us? I shoved those thoughts aside and tried to focus on fixing the wheel. I opened my truck. I found my spare tire, but only a spare wheel. All my tools to fix it were gone. Nowhere to be found. How was I supposed to fix my stupid tire without tools? I nearly screamed again. I shut my trunk and leaned against the driver's side door and waited for someone to drive by and help. You okay? John asked after a while. We were both standing... We were both standing in the pouring rain, in the dark, in the middle of nowhere. Neither of us were happy. Our suits were soaked. Our hair looked like we had just taken a shower. It was late. We were tired and stressed out. Things just weren't looking good for us. What do you think? I said. I wasn't trying to sound rude, but I guess that was just the vibe I put out because John scooted away from me a little bit and didn't say anything for a while. We waited in the rain for half an hour before a car finally stopped to help us. A man and a young woman get out of the car. The lady had long brown hair and a braid down her back and hippie-looking clothing. She had a kind face and walked toward us with welcoming arms. What happened? she asked, sounding genuinely concerned. Flat tire, John said. He sounded in a better mood than I was. Even if he had been acting strangely lately, he he was still more chipper than me. We can't find Ryan's tools. Oh, that's terrible, the woman said. We have tools. Go help them change their tire, Josh. The man she was with was tall and extremely muscular, to the point that it was kind of weird. He wore a plain white t-shirt and jeans. He didn't seem like he would be dating the woman he was with. If they were dating, if they were dating, that is. He nodded in her direction and went to the trunk of the black car. Shortly thereafter, he came back with the necessary tools and helped us change my tire. In just a few minutes, we were ready to go. <laughs> Thank you so much. This really means a lot. Oh, no problem at all, the woman said, grinning. Just one question, though. What's with the car with the two scary-looking men in the back there? They've just been sitting there the whole time. John and I looked back at the car, and then back at each other. Neither of us had noticed it until she pointed it out. It was sleek and black, nearly unnoticeable in the dark from that distance. I thought of my feet. Oh, that's the FBI. We're detectives working on a case with them. It's nothing to worry about. It was something to worry about. Interesting, the woman said. The man stood beside her silently the whole time they'd helped us. Well, good luck with your case. Thank you. And again, thank you so much for the help. I smiled at her. And John and I got back into the car, thoroughly soaking wet. What should we do about them? John said, pointing at the FBI car tailing us. Just let them do whatever. There was nothing for us to hide. We didn't do what they think we did, I said. I started up the car and kept driving. John and I were silent the whole ride to Bellingham. The car kept trailing us all the way to Anne's parents' house. We tried acting like we didn't see them. We tried to act normal as we could. It was hard. We did as good a job as possible. Soon we pulled up to Anne's parents' house. It was a small little house just outside the city. They owned a little ranch with three horses. 
They were neighing in the barn a little ways from the house. They sounded panicked, but I didn't know anything about horses. So, for all I knew, that was what they sounded like all the time. John and I walked up to the front door of their shabby little house. Anne's car was sitting outside. It had frost on the windows. And what looked like fresh mud on the tires. Maybe she had just come back. The paint on the house was peeling and the grass was unkempt. The stairs creaked as we walked up them onto the porch. I knocked on the door. But as I knocked, it just opened. I pushed it further open and John and I walked in skeptically. The air was freezing cold and bugs were crawling on the ground. The first room we came to was the living room. The furniture had that typical old lady pattern of canvas flowers. The furniture was covered in those plastic covers. The window next to the television was broken. Glass was all over the ground. The television was on. The news broadcaster's voice rang through the silent house. It was eerie. The floor creaked beneath our feet as we kept walking slowly through the house. We got to the kitchen. The fridge was open and the sink was running. Food was sitting on the counter like someone was about to prepare a meal. The food was rotting, and there was a slight stench in the air. It was starting to get various colors of mold on it. Flies buzzed around the plate, loving the stench of the disgusting food. John walked over and looked at it. He winced a little. One of those flies just bit me, he said. He poked at the food, and a bunch of fruit flies jumped off the food onto the table. We couldn't tell what the food even was. The table was set, and one of the chairs was pulled out from it, like someone was sitting there, watching the other person cook. I started to see specks of blood on the floor as we kept walking. We followed the blood drops until they turned into trails of blood. Some places it was hard to make out on the brown carpet. The trail led into a room that appeared to be an office, but also kept going down the hallway. The trail led to a room that appeared to be an office, but also kept going down the hall. We decided to go room by room and started with the office. It had a computer, printer, and a desk with some cabinets. The blood trail went right past everything and up the walls. It stopped halfway to the ceiling. John told me to come over to where he was. I walked around the desk on the side where the chair was. The chair was covered in blood, and so were the keyboard and the top of the desk. Some of the keys were missing from the keyboard. The monitor was completely broken, and the mouse was hanging down. The damage and destruction of the desk area were not the most disturbing part. The worst was all over the keyboard. We found teeth like someone had gotten their face slammed into it repeatedly and their teeth had fallen out. The monitor still had glass around the frame. It was coated in blood. And on one long shard, there was an eyeball. It was brown. So it had the veins attached to it. There was some hair caught in the glass on the side of the monitor. It was long, white. Sort of crinkly. At least I knew it wasn't Anna's. I went to pull the chair from the desk, and as I did, I heard a loud thump. I looked down, and there was a hand coming out from under the desk. John and I crouched down to have a better look. Shit. It was Anna's mom. She was curled up under the desk, her knees against her chest sitting up. Her left eye was out of its socket. Some teeth were missing as well, and there was a few holes in her scalp where hair and skin should be. We could see the white bone of her cracked skull. Her right eye was still in its socket. It was swollen and black with bits of blood trickling down the pale white cheek. Her nose was severely broken. We could see the cracked bone beneath the crust of blood. We decided not to touch the body and continue down the hallway. The blood trail was on the ground for a good five to six feet, and then it swerved to the left and went up the wall. We followed it on the wall until it came to a door. The door was locked, and after several attempts to break it in with our shoulders, John kicked it in. It was Anna's dad's personal room. Bachelor pad, if you will. It had a flat screen, computer, fish tank, various mounted animal heads, a gun cabinet, a cigar humidor. We didn't stay long in that room. 
the first thing we saw was her dad's body. He was ripped in half and replaced on the wall with his mounted bear head. His lower body was still standing up, right below him on the ground. On the wooden plaque where it reads the name, size, and weight of the bear, someone had carved over it. It said collateral. And below it it said you can't run. Maybe this will get those damn FBI agents to finally believe Stitch is real. Maybe this will get them off my back. John and I went outside to find the FBI agents. They weren't in their car, so we assumed that they were following us around the house. We turned to go back into the house and look for them, and we saw them coming towards us. Their guns were drawn, but they weren't pointing them at us. Do you believe that Stitch is behind all this now? I asked. Do you believe we didn't kill repetitive routine? We don't know what to think, one man said. He scratched his head and rubbed his chin. Maybe we should call the local authorities. They might have some insight on this couple. Maybe someone was out to get them. We'll also call in for more agents. This might be beyond your control. If what you're telling us is true. Didn't you see what was written on the plaque? It was Stitch, John said, getting flustered. Show us, the second man said. We walked back into the house and tried not to look at the gore too much. We got to Anna's dad's room and showed them the plaque. They looked at the words carefully. Collateral, huh? the first man said. Collateral for what? We're thinking he has my partner, Anna. She's been missing for a little while now. We don't know where she is, I said. We definitely need to call the locals. We need all the help that we can get. The second man pulled out his phone and dialed 911. He told the operator about him being an FBI agent and needing backup. He asked for the address. I gave it to him. And we waited for the police to arrive. Maybe we should go check on the horses, John said. We don't know how long these people have been dead. They might be needing food and whatnot. We all agreed and walked back out into the cold. It might have been dark and freezing cold out, but it was a nice change to the disgusting sights inside of the house. I loved the open field that lay outside, between the house and the neighboring house. Although it did remind me of the dream that I had a couple of days ago. As we walked further into the field, my heart began to beat faster. I found myself staring into the woods that surrounded the property. I can still hear that loud, groaning sound from my dreams. I know it was just a dream, but it was... It still makes me nervous. We walked towards the barn quietly. Part of the thought, maybe, Stitch was waiting for me. The barn was like a typical horse barn. Red outside and stalls inside with open windows so the horse could get fresh air when they were inside. We opened the door. It squeaked loudly. You could smell the stench of decay from 20 feet away from the barn. I doubt I was the only person who noticed it. All of the straw and hay on the ground of the barn was damp and stuck to the bottom of our shoes. It felt gross beneath my feet. I almost slipped a couple of times. The horses were in the back of the barn in the last three stalls. As we got closer, we noticed only two of them were there alive. And they were just skin bones. You could see every bone in their body. And their knees sounded like they were in pain and scared. They could barely stand. Their legs were close to collapsing underneath them. As I checked them out, I noticed they had a rope around their necks. Why would they have rope around their necks? When we found the horses, three more policemen showed up. We were the closest officers to your location. We checked out the house and called for more backup, though. One of the officers said, almost out of breath. Oh my god, what's that smell? The other said. He put his hand over his nose and mouth. That's what we're here to find out, I said. I opened the stall where the third horse should have been. I wish I didn't. The only thing left in there was the scalp of the horse. Its whole mane and the horse tail was on the ground. The tail had a giant chunk of meat at the end of it. It's still connected. If someone ripped it off the horse. 
next to these things on the ground, there were three of its hooves. Jesus Christ. Where did the other hoof go? Where did the body go? John yelled. We all walked away from the stall, and one of the FBI agents ordered another officer to take the two remaining horses out of the barn and take them to the veterinary clinic. As we opened the stall to one of the living horses, blood was everywhere. All over the horse's feet, its mouth, and its hair. We couldn't see any wounds or anything on it, though. Around the food, there were flies flying. I walked closer and my nose started to burn. There was a lot of meat in it. Some of the meat was still connected to bones, but they didn't look like human bones. They were much too big, much larger than human bones. The joints were different. The horses had been eating the third horse, whose body we couldn't find. Who the fuck does this? I thought. Guys. I think I found the third horse. I said. Trying not to puke. 